In this episode of Mind Pump, the world's top fitness, health, and entertainment podcast, we answer fitness and health questions asked by listeners like you. We also have an introductory portion where we talk about studies. Uh, We mention our lives. We sometimes talk about our sponsors. So what I'm going to do is give you a breakdown of the whole episode. But before I do, I want to let all of you know that we have a free hard gainer class webinar that we're offering to everybody who has trouble building muscle. All you super fast metabolism, people who don't seem to gain muscle or strength very easily. You eat whatever you want. Nothing's happening. You lift weights. Nothing's happening. You want to figure out why your body's not building muscle. Check out this class that I taught and I break everything down. I give you everything you need to know to get your hard gainer body to response. It's at hardgainerwebinar.com. Okay, so here's what went on in today's episode. We open up by talking about the coin shortage Again, I feel like this is a conspiracy, Justin. (laughs) This is crazy. Adam definitely felt the need to bring it up again. Then I talk about maybe starting to run for exercise. Don't lose. I'm I'm telling the truth here. I'm not making it up. Don't hurt yourself, Sal. Uh, We also talk about how the toy industry may be crumbling because the movie industry is not making any movies, any new movies to sell those toys. We talk about Roblox, Fortnite, and other games catering to virtual parties and hangouts. Um, I talk about how micro-schooling is starting to become more popular. We mentioned one of our sponsors, Viori, and how their performance jogger is getting mentioned all over the internet as being the most comfortable, best-looking joggers you could buy anywhere. Truth. By the way, Viori, because we work with them, we have a discount code for you. If you want to check out their stuff and get 25% off, here's what you got to do. Go to vioriclothing.com. That's V-U-O-R-I clothing.com forward slash mind pump. There's a code on that page for 25% off. Then I talk about how I've got three more months before my baby is here. That's uh, nerve-wracking and exciting. Sweating a little. Then we talk about uh, Adam's son's first steps. He's walking now. That's good. Good for you, Adam. Uh, Then we talk about the meat sticks that we love eating so much from Paleo Valley. These are grass-fed meat sticks. They're never dry. They're very delicious. Best snack you can find with the macros and in terms of health and quality. Hands um, down. And you can get 15% off because, you know, you listen to Mind Pump. Go to paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O valley.com forward slash Mind Pump. Use the code MINDPUMP15 and get 15% off your first order. So that was about 40 minutes. Then we got into answering some questions. The first question, this person says, look, in following a full body routine, is it better to stick to the same exercises each time or alternate them with each workout? The next question, this person says, look, you guys often talk about eating a high-protein diet, but studies from the blue zones, these are areas of the world where people live a long time, show people eating low-protein. What's the deal? Should I eat high-protein or low-protein? The next question, this person is a personal trainer, wants to know how to pivot their business due to the fitness industry being hammered so much by COVID. And the final question, this person wants to fix their anterior Pelvic tilt is where the butt sticks out, the mm. core is weak, and the low back tends to have Instagram model pick some pain. Also, this month, Maps Strong is 50% off. Maps Strong is one of our best muscle building workout programs. Now, it's got conventional exercises, but it also has some, some unconventional strongman exercises. In other words, it's a fun muscle building routine. There is a special focus on the posterior chain, so back butt and hamstrings. So if those are areas you really want to focus on, get this program. It's also great for speeding up the metabolism because it is a potent muscle builder. The side effects of that is you burn more calories all the time just because you have more muscle, which makes being lean or getting lean much easier. Anyhow, it's half off. Here's how you get that discount. Go to mapsstrong.com, M-A-P-S-S-T-R-O-N-G.com and use the code STRONG50. That's S T R O N G five zero. No space for the discount. Um, I'm going to beat you, Sal, to this. Uh, uh, hey, wait. What do you, you got know. to say? Not much, actually. Uh, no, I do. I have a bone to pick. Uh, remember uh, with the guy who uh, corrected Justin and I about the thirty or thirty uh, percent overstatement. Wait, th- this wait is, a minute. You reversed your stance, and now right. you're coming back. That's right. This oh, is not gonna, over. Now I'm gonna, it's right. Now I'm going to punk you, guy. Are you yeah. ready? <laughs> so, <laughs> you punked me in my DMs. I submitted. Now I'm coming back. I'm going to punk you on the side. Listen to this. Ooh, here we go. We all know about the coin sor- shortage going on, right? Coin shortage. Yes. yes. So to the you know that's so crazy that like Kroger's, like one of the largest grocery chains in the country 
has literally put out a statement refusing to give back exact change. What? So yeah, you cannot go to that grocery store and if you give if you buy something for is that a, legal? I, I mean, I don't know. Dude, I don't know how that works. I, I feel like you have to give people money that's they don't have it. There's that much of a shortage that there's wow. Put, they just don't have coins. So here's the bone that I have to pick. They'll give you free candy instead or something. So the guy who came back and and corrected Justin, which he was right. It was not thirty. Yeah, hey, I, I thought it was you. It was uh, yeah. seventeen. Right? Did I say seventeen percent or seven percent? <laughs> Something or like it was he, less. He it was just, less. He just pushed his mistake on me. Did yeah. you see yeah, that? I, yeah. I did. <laughs> yeah, All right, so, let's keep it's going. Probably you gave me the advice in the first place. <laughs> just glaze over it though, real quick. So. There is actually a place in Wisconsin, Wisconsin Community Bank, okay, Wisconsin State Community Bank, okay, is giving five percent for anybody who turns in their coins. Oh, because of the coins. So yes, Ooh. that's right, buddy. So you're giving up seventeen percent of your coins to have some robot do it for you, or you could take the time to roll them yourself and gain five percent by turning your coins in. Oh, this how is, about them apples? That's right. <laughs> remember, remember when I made that, buddy. <laughs> remember when I made fun of Justin for for getting you know fifty cent pieces for mowing lawns? Yeah. Turns out it was walking. It was walking wiener dogs. You could have made why just wiener dogs? Why not the other dogs? It's just that's what was there. <laughs> that's, yeah. Was that in your wiener stage? <laughs> I, it's, it's a wiener it's phase. Wiener's everything. Yeah, a specialty. Yeah, yes, I do. <laughs> I, like, I own one now. He took that like whole thing about niching his, down your business his, real seriously. His, there. his trapper yeah. keeper had focus all on drawn all over it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just drawing, and I'm like, it was just my whole life. Yes, yeah, <laughs> could just see him just door to door trying to get done. Wiener town, wiener <laughs> town. It's so fun. <laughs> Hi, I like to walk yeah. wieners. So anyway, um, you would have made five extra percent now because. You could have turned in your coins to the Wisconsin bank and man. gotten five percent. I'm excited. Man. I, I feel waited. like this coin shortage is all part of the new world order agenda to remove money and to. Oh, I thought we were talking we about more conspiracies. <laughs> Can we get a podcast up this week without getting it's the a Illuminati? Uh, I, I, I'm telling you. No, I don't know. I'm yeah. just kidding. I'm joking. It's, That's weird, though, right? To have a, I think a, it's a shortage. True, yeah. Of coins, it's really not that weird. Um, very, I mean, uh, so many businesses are shut down, uh, which what, you're gonna you're gonna see that. What if there's a cash shortage next? Ooh. Well, Oof. there will be. I mean, isn't that inevitable? Yeah. Because right now, what's what's happening is how many people we are, my friends and I we were just talking about this weekend when we were hanging out that uh, they were like, dude, when was the last time you used cash to buy something? Mm -hmm. You know, you just you're not. We're and if you're still making purchases right now, first of all, a large portion of the country is probably scaling back on, mm -hmm. on spending money right now. You know, I think everybody's starting to go like, okay, maybe I should be a little more conservative about uh, my spending. So you're already spending less. Then you're not going out to places. Uh, even if you are spending, you're spending from home. Mm -hmm. If you're spending from home, there's no cash exchange whatsoever. This is all Venmo. This is all, you know, credit cards online. So plus the printers yeah. are not printing as much because they don't have as many workers wow. working like they normally do. That was part of the problem too. Apparently, Dude, so the, I, the I, last time I spent one, I bought a Lucha Libre mask. With the oh, you wanted to Just, do it? Yeah, you, you got the black market mask. Yeah. That was your last. That was my last time I used, used cash. Ooh, yeah. Really? Yeah, solid. My purchase. last purchase. So. Yeah, I like cash. I don't know. I like cash because uh, how dirty it is. It's yeah. <laughs> all the cocaine remnants. You can wow, get from it. you guys Whoa. are terrible. <laughs> what? I mean, that's what, it's you. true. No, I like it because cocaine and caca. It's there. You know yeah. what I mean? It's there. It's yours. It's in your hand. And well, didn't uh, they say that? Didn't they originally come out and say that was like one of the the uh, worst or one of the best ways that the, the uh, best ways not the right word for that was we'll use it though uh, to tr uh, for uh, COVID to transfer. Oh, transmit cash. to somebody else. Yeah, because the exchange of cash is how uh, oh, dirty dude. cash is. You know what? Back so, when they thought it was all transferable from surfaces. Well, here, I mean, here's the other thing too. It's cash is how a lot of people avoid paying taxes. You know, they do jobs for cash and then they end up not reporting it or whatever. You eliminate all cash. Essentially, the government is is thinking that they're going to automatically have way you know collect more taxes mm -hmm. because now you know they can trace your. Whatever you're doing for cash, they can now right. trace easier. Enter Bitcoin, huh? Ooh. Yeah, that's the that's that's the that's the answer to some of that in that in that regard or whatever. I still believe we're going that way. I don't spend, so? Yeah, I don't spend a lot of time messing and watching it anymore. But I, I wonder if it's yeah. up. I bought. Remember when you and I bought some? Oh yeah. I, think I just worry about everything being electronic. Under. You know, there, there's still that potential that, uh, you know, as far as like my 
conspiracy brain goes where they can mess with the internet and they can mess with you know the emps could could knock out all power and then what what are we going to exchange with we'll go back to barter system with goats yeah <laughs> i yeah. love just so he, much yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's first right. thing that comes to his mind goats. we should start a goat farm dude just goats you <laughs> yes, know like that used to be the currency mind pumps invest in dude, a goat farm dude i need to I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna i might start doing something really crazy mm. soon mm. i might start running a little bit just like <laughs> like Stop, cardio yeah. stop yeah, like like running stop. running you're just trying to get last in the podcast no right no now. no no is this because all the montages you've been watching no oh you mean the rocky montages yeah oh those are so good <laughs> no here's why okay i caught myself doing this the other day i i don't remember what i had to like move fast for but i had to kind of move fast to get somewhere and it was a short <laughs> distance it was like from here to like 10 feet yeah i was like you know, maybe 20 30 feet right yeah. and I, you know what i did i did the old man jog do you know what i'm talking about you ever seen the old man jog the old man jog, the legs don't really yeah. move faster, but the upper body the does. upper body twists. <laughs> yeah. The, the legs are just... Dude, 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 I like did a, that. Like a video game? Yeah, I did that when my <laughs> arms were doing this and my legs were still walking. And I'm like, what <laughs> is happening? <laughs> yeah, you're not moving fast. I need, to, I need to run or I'll forget how to run. <laughs> <laughs> this is terrible. It's a lost skill. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> I, I always think about that. I don't want to lose like my ability to jump and like you know cut and turn and do all, like, dude. If I don't have my athleticism, who am I? Mm. You know well, I mean? you do represent that for us. That's why I feel like I can slack off on it a little bit. So yeah. Justin can move. Yeah. Yeah. You don't ever lose that because then yeah. we're screwed. I feel okay. like as long as that's together it, we can all do, we can accomplish whatever fitness task mm. that's, that's true. out there. Oh, I remember we just what need I was somebody running. to to you know show the example. I remember why. I was running. I had to pee hella bad, like really, really bad. And then I made it to the bathroom and pee. Which, by the way, I don't know of a more sat. Is there anything more satisfying than peeing after you've been holding your pee for way too long? I'm oh, not, not I mean that, that noise immediately is like a. Oh, yeah, it's you, like, you can't help but do that. Yeah, it's like a um, incredible. That's why I did the fake run. That was because I was gonna, uh, I was gonna pee myself on accident. Right. So, are you like treadmill running, or are you gonna run the pavement like? Old school. I don't know how I'm going to start this. I feel like I'm going to start by running uh, like five steps every mm. day, and then I'll increase it to 10 steps. No, <laughs> I don't know. I'm, honestly, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to get myself some running shoes and then maybe do like a mile, you know, here and there, which mm. I haven't run a mile <laughs> in a long time. No idea what that's going to be like. Really? Yeah. Is this another excuse to get you new balances? <laughs> yeah, I, I see what you're doing. Yeah, no, I try and do that at least every every month or two months. I will. I'll yeah, get on, you've I'll said get on, that before. Yeah, yeah, I'll get on the treadmill and and just make sure that I can. Right, I mean that's kind of what the. How, what do you do a mile? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's kind of I'll run sometimes longer. It just depends on the mood. I feel like after the uh once I hit like a ten minute mark of running, it's actually really it's almost therapeutic. I enjoy it. you get that runner's high. It takes about ten minutes for me mm -hmm. for the first like sweat that you break. Uh, and then I'll do it. You know, I'll just it's just not it's just something I do intermittently. It's not something I do consistently every single day. And it is for the exact reason what you just said. I don't want to lose that. I don't want I don't want if and when I need to take off for a sprint or I just don't see any other time or where it could be possible that I would need to run further than a mile. As long as I can run a mile efficiently and get there pretty quick and outrun my child, I feel pretty good. <laughs> outrun? <Yeah. laughs> oh, so you catch Dad! Yeah, yeah. Yo, oh, dude. here. Little kids will do that. My nephew, we, Jessica and I were watching my nephew, and he's a little shit, man. Like He'll look at you, and the second he knows he's far enough to take off, he goes. So we were, we were in San Mateo downtown, and we were hanging out with him. This was before COVID or whatever. And, you know, he's, I'm holding his hand. He's a little, and again, he's a smart little kid, right? So he's holding my hand, being a good little kid or whatever. And then he, like, tries to pull his hand away. And I said, no, I got to hold your hand because the street's over there and there's cars. Mm -hmm. And he goes, I know run. I know run. And so I said, okay, I'm going to give you a chance to, to, to walk or whatever. So he walks in front of me and he's walking and he's looking to the left and to the right. And then I see him kind of peek back and I have a feeling like this. He's going to bolt. Does. He yeah. bolts. No. Yes. Boom. And then I chase him. And what do you think he's doing the whole time? <laughs> laughing. He's, he thinks it's the you. funnest thing in the world. <laughs> and he's heading right for the what? intersection. Dude, what is that? I yeah. Know, like, oh, I'm, that was the one time like my my youngest like, oh, like drove me completely insane. And it was in a parking lot like that. <laughs> I'm like, stay right here. You know, like, please, you know, stay close to dad. And then just 
took off. <laughs> and then a car pulls out like right in front of him and barely like oh. gets, oh my God, like yeah, my heart stopped. I've got an interesting conversation around kids and money since we just were talking about those two things right now. Uh, check this out. You know, we, we talk about all these unintended consequences from the shutdown and what's happening. Mm-hmm. And this is one that like didn't, it wasn't even on my radar uh, that I would have thought of. And let's see if you guys can piece this together. So think of some of the things that are going to affect major businesses of movies being shut down. So movies are shut down, right? All, all right. summer, it's already been said, yeah. summer's canceled and not happening. Yeah, which has sucked. Which hurts the movie industry. That's obvious, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're a movie theater, uh, you know, or produce movies, whatever, that's, that's obvious going to affect them. But w- with children, what and 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 uh, that's that industry. What do you think it's going to to cripple? If so, hold on a second. Because there's no movies. That's right. Uh, and in regard to kids, what's that going to cripple? Uh, I don't know. Popcorn, toys. Oh, so oh, the, so yeah. merchandise. So listen yeah. to this. That's the toy, right. The toy industry fact figures that movies, summer blockbuster movies, are responsible for twenty one percent of their revenue, which adds up to over twenty billion dollars. And there's a no year. movies to drive wow. the toys. And here's it gets worse. Man, all that stuff was planned. So all the toy companies have made all these toys for wow. all the blockbuster movies that were supposed to come out. And they're just sitting in a warehouse. They're just the sitting shelves. in warehouses. So now oh. what do you do? Do you, Kids aren't going to buy toys of movies they've never seen before. So there's all these toys that have been made to sell to kids from these blockbuster movies that were supposed to come out in summer that are like sitting in warehouses or about to get shipped out to places like Target. And now Target has the they have to decide, do we want to receive these, put them on our shelves, or try and store these and sell them what? Next year, when they potentially release wow, this movie, I didn't even think of that. I, either did I. Dang. It's, it's totally true because movies drive a ton of those sales. Twenty-one percent they they attribute to, to all to, a quarter of toy sales is is because of movies. Yeah, wow. and with no movies, talk about wow. That makes a perfect sense. That's interesting. I I would wonder then. If there's a big push by these video game companies to, you know, get into the merchandising part of that to kind of make up for the that shelf space. Mm, uh-huh. Well, you're talking about video games. Here's a pivot that all video games are starting to do right now. A company called Roblox, uh, Fortnite, mm. uh, some other chasing uh, game. I forget what the name of the app was. They're all trying to figure out, okay, gaming is blowing up, is going like crazy right now because everybody's at home. Now, how do we hear our audience and, and, uh, and, and find other ways to, uh, you know, get more attention which they're already getting a ton of so now they're all pivoting into like these uh virtual parties and virtual birthday parties with built in within the game so the kids can all get together like community and hang out and purchase things in app and do things together and so they're all catering to the oh that's interesting i've seen because my kids will play you know and like in, in roblox they have like um like areas where you can actually like have your own food uh cafeterias where people come oh, in so they you're buy familiar with foods, that game. all that stuff oh yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, so i'm not familiar with that game oh yeah, all. Yeah, the yeah that's article. one of those i'm like i'm monitoring it constantly to see who's like hitting them up because yeah because they could talk to each other dude cause i don't it, like that part. again here's the other part of it is all the you know the catfish like pedo dudes out there that are in you know th- that's like you you know, it draws where all the kids are is where it draws. Is that a real thing in that? Right? Is that? Oh ha- yeah, sure. They, that they message them and everything. They pose as like another seven year old. Yeah. Now, right? now, is that you guys just saying that because you've heard that, or have you guys experienced that with your own kids? Oh, I've you, never. Do, I haven't seen it with my kids. Um, but uh, no, there's. They, my kids legit. tell me like they they look out for it. Like I have them like we talk. So about they're it a lot. aware of like catfishing. They know what the, what what that is. If they don't know who it is, even if they because they they approach them like really nice and like you know try and like do Be all this friendly. extra stuff for them. Give them all these things, mm-hmm. and and then like, oh, it's so nice. I'm like, who is? I don't know who this is. Okay, that well, you got to get out, you know, and like get get in a different area and like drop this this guy. Yeah. Do Do you guys remember the first like toy that you bought that was based off of like a movie or TV show that you free, that you loved? You guys remember that? GI Joe, Star Wars. Oh, you guys. Oh yeah, of yeah. course you had Star Wars. Oh, Did you yeah. have a whole bunch of them? Oh my god, I had like still, action figures. Still does, I still right? have them. Still you see that picture I had? Well, I, have, like, I call him. I Facetime only, him. He, and I catch him playing. <laughs> he, he only uses <laughs> them during what sex. What are you doing, bro? Oh, oh, the wife isn't home right oh, now. I'm playing with my Star Wars toys. <laughs> You're my sister. This is weird. Huh? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah. Gross. Yeah. Did you have the, that you, one on us? Did you have the Millennium Falcon and all that stuff? Yeah, dude. I had the Millennium Falcon. I had at ats. I had like. Aren't those worth money? 
Uh, I mean, I played with them though. You know, like I didn't like have them all like, aggressively too, dude. But it's like, who buys toys and they just keeps them in the in the packaging and puts them on the shelf and is like, uh, like it's like some kind of weird like trophy. Did I ever tell you I had a friend in high school uh, that used to collect? all the uh, McDonald's toys and he kept them in the plastic and he had this massive bag. Those oh, are actually worth it. I know. I guarantee it's worth it. They have like a McDonald's Beckett that has all the mm-hmm. toys and how much, and I, I I would love to know where this So many is hamburglers. At. Yeah, this yep. is like my freshman year in high school, my friend, and I have no idea where he is at in life now and what he's doing. I wish I knew because I'm just curious about that stash because he had probably thousands I, and all in the plastic. I had a friend who had uh, He-Man and Castle Grayskull. Oh yeah, all Sick. in the box, untouched, and he sold it for a thousand or two thousand dollars. Really? Like yeah. Wow. Dang. All in, but again, I'm like Justin. What kind of a weird kid are you if you get a toy and you leave it in the box and never so, touch I, it? Okay, I feel yeah. this way about the a community that I'm very familiar with is the sneakerhead community, uh, and there's oh, yeah. there's a there's a lot of money to be made in these sneakers. But I don't. I didn't. That's how I justify spending my money on them is because they're they're valued like that. But that's not what makes like I don't buy my sneakers and just like put them away, mm-hmm. so they hold value. And then there's mm-hmm. but there's kids that make big money in that. In fact, I was reading an article the other day about some of the ways that kids are making. There's this like 15 year old kid that buys like 50 pair of sneakers every month and he's and then he holds them for a little while then flips them and sells them and makes a ton of money doing that the whole reason why i buy my sneakers is because i want to wear them so i wear mine and i think it's the same thing it's like yeah you buy those things because you mm-hmm. like them you want to play with them they're I also buy them. functional yeah, yeah. exactly so yeah sneakers are very functional so i want to wear them but i know but you know in the sneaker world they still hold value i mean i can still sell you can I can't still s- wear somebody else's shoes yeah yeah that's a big deal if you take good care of them and you keep them in in like you know reasonable condition yeah. and if you have a collection like i do where you rotate through i feel like, I feel like I, it's kind of weird to wear someone else's yeah shirt. i'm like, like i'm thinking it's been in there well i'm thinking about the really? weirdos with the fetishes you know that like smell like oh yeah this, i mean what's adam <laughs> what do you hate <laughs> once you sell what do you give a shit out <laughs> yeah, I, don't give it, I don't care if you hump my shoe you know what i'm saying <laughs> do whatever you want with my shoes like uh, I, they're not does mine it anymore bother you anymore no like, it doesn't bother uh, me like there are there are some weirdos. Maybe like those that. weirdos will pay more for them. You know what I'm saying? Oh, like, I guarantee it. Yeah, yeah you know, make them extra funky. You know, I just like, you know, did some <laughs> yeah. crazy workout. That's these. gross. Yeah. Whatever. That's gross. No, when I when I was a kid, I had uh, a lot of He Man. He Man was was the ultimate toy, and, and He Man beat the crap out of everybody. GI Joe beat the crap. He had out the of my best pecs. He was, yeah. it was. You know what they did? I mean, <laughs> if you look at it, literally, they took a pro bodybuilder and made it into a, a yeah. figurine. Yeah. yeah. And you wonder why I had body image it's like issues. Like, this is my toy when I yeah. was a kid. You know, what I, mean? oh, I don't look like him at all. <laughs> yeah. He's so powerful. Do you remember his punching action? You just twist his body and then he just untwists. Oh my you guys god! Remember yeah, that? just like yeah. this. Yeah. yeah, I remember Speaking that. Speaking of kids, you know what's uh, exploding right now? Mm. They call it micro schooling. So micro schooling is where parents get together. Uh, like four or five parents of kids who are close or whatever. Yeah. And then one of the parents will host the kids and do education. This is the future. At home. And then they'll kind of rotate from, from, from home to home or whatever. Yeah. A lot of parents are doing we're, it. So Ooh. we're actually like structuring that in our community right Same. now. Same. Yeah. So I have a call with my best friend later on today, uh, who's the principal of a high school. And this is our exact conversation and topic because he wants to start a podcast and he wants to center it around helping those types of parents. Oh, that's brilliant. Bl- blowing yeah, up. That, I know. That, that is definitely going to be the way people are going to handle this. So my, I have, uh, I used to train clients who were huge in the homeschool community. Their son had a terrible experience in school. They took him out and they, and they're very, they were retired, uh, very successful, um, you know, tech executives. And they, you know, they, they worked for a company that went public and they were able to retire. So they had all this time to dedicate to really studying and understanding education and homeschooling and all that stuff. And, you know, they told me, they said, you know, what's funny. They said, the minute parents realize it's not as hard and crazy as you think and that there's all the resources, all these crazy resources, the minute they start to realize that and they get over that learning curve, they're never going to go back. Yep. So they, they're they saying basically this spike is probably going to stay permanent or close to permanent because once people get the hang of it and get over that, 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 again, that learning curve of the schedule and what does it look like, what are the resources and what are the state requirements for testing mm-hmm. you know once you get over that they're like yeah no one's gonna, they're not going to go back 
Yeah. They're going to see how much, how I just, much better. Yeah, I'm just waiting for them to figure out the whole sports and Little League and all that kind of stuff and like how we're going to handle that with, uh, you know, with the kids and uh, maybe maybe like no fans or anything, but they just have these outdoor events where they can still play because, I mean, sports is such a vital part of, you know, growing up and developing as a kid. Well, and it's I just, also massive business. Once you, get to the, business yeah. once you get to the collegiate level, mm-hmm. it's massive, massive. So just because of that, that's being figured out. There's no way, like, yeah, uh, like of course. I, like my buddy was talking about that too, and I'm like, I don't even think about that or worry about that because that is such. There's big, too much money. There's in so it. much money in that that right now, I guarantee, eighty percent of like college's focus is around that right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they know that is the biggest money driver of everything, and I, I think that's just what we're gonna see. I think like in this, we had this <clears throat> debate back and forth. My buddy, who's the principal in Iowa, that we kind of like because I've been saying for you know, a couple of years now that I think education is going to be completely shook up. And, you know, he would completely, he would debate that with me all the time. And now he's kind of like, okay, well, I didn't see this COVID thing happening mm-hmm. and this is really shaking everything up. Right. He's all, but I still don't think it's going to completely get shaken up because of sports. And I was like, I disagree again. I think that it's just going to evolve and be different. Mm-hmm. We already have examples of non-school related sports. There's rec leagues. I've mm-hmm. played in rec oh, yeah. leagues my entire life growing up. And it's community driven and and organized, and so sandlot style. Yeah, you're gonna have you're just gonna have that for you know groups and of people and towns, and they'll be able to compete against other. I don't think it's gonna be that hard to organize that for you know a. The only reason why you don't see it that popular now is the homeschool community is not large enough. Mm-hmm. But if you if you guys all believe yeah, well, that well, we're gonna homes- see a large percentage go that way, then it's going to. Well, the homeschool community, I guarantee it, uh, oftentimes does put their kids in extracurricular uh, sports and activities. So right. it is very big with them, and they'll sign up for leagues. Uh, or you know for clubs or whatever to for for activity or for sport because it is it's very important it's not just important for physical uh, I think it's, health it's good for mental health team building yeah, yeah learning to I work mean, with others I think it's going to be better right I mean we believe I mean I think we all agree we're we're all kind of lean towards free market and that's what this is doing right this is yeah, it's forcing everybody it's that forcing direction. everybody into that and I I have faith in humanity and the ability for us to come together organize and figure yeah. things out well, better the, than allowing it's government definitely to the dictate. silver lining I think I, I I appreciate the fact that it's disrupting this whole thing that I think needed to you know, be disrupted. It needs to be looked at and, and done differently. And I think that this is an opportunity we can take now to really make a, a massive change. No, there's, there's there's pressure. The pressures on education before to change were were mainly in the higher education because the cost of college had far exceeded uh, inflation, just exploded. And it started to get to the point where people were questioning, was it worth a degree? Is it worth a degree to, to, to go into debt um, you know, tens of thousands or a hundred thousand um, dollars. Well, I guess it depends on the degree and people. People are doing that. People were doing that for a while, so there was that pressure. There was that that strong signal. But now we have the very strong signal of of COVID, where there it's it's not an option. It's not an option to send your kid to school in the traditional sense. So of course, people are going to start looking at other things. And I also, I think the same thing. I think once people start to see what that looks like, and now that there's a big market demand for it, you're going to start to see some some uh, innovation, some innovation, and some mm-hmm. market solutions. Yeah. And here's the, I mean, here's the truth. I mean, especially in a modern uh, economy, you you're largely valued for your specialized skill, not for your broad general skills. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. if you do a job, it's because you're really good at a, a one or two things, not because you also understand algebra and history and English or all those other things. So that specialized- Ornamental horticulture. Yeah, whatever. That specialized uh, knowledge uh, and information is just, it's more valuable. Um, and I predict that the market's going to going to play more to that, you know, yeah. where, okay, here's your state standards, got to pass the test. But now let's get you to specialize in the stuff that you enjoy doing. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a So that's if that's all thing. true, I th- do, do you think that, I mean, <clears throat> teachers are going to be in a very similar situation as personal trainers are right now? I think teachers are always, there's always going to be a demand for teachers. But I think the way that they're going to deliver their right, so that's is just like we were giving out the notice on trainers uh, like a year ago, even before COVID hit. That the future of training is, you know, you need to build this kind of virtual model to support your business because it's moving oh. in that direction. 
the same thing I think goes for teachers. And you know, even if you're tenured and your and your job is set and you think and you feel confident in that, if that space is really going to evolve and change, I'd be working at, on that right now. Right. I yeah. think this is the time to be thinking about that. It was just really cool to see my best friend and his brain working that way and seeing that. Oh, you know what? This moving into this podcast space, trying to provide value for these educators that are now going to be educating at home or in like micro groups, like you're saying, I think is going to have tremendous value if he can become a voice in that space. And because he's an authority already Mm -hmm. in that position with lots of experience, man, I I see, I think that's a brilliant. I think it's an opportunity. A huge opportunity. opportunity. Yeah. If if I'm a teacher right now, I'm going to be looking at ways I could deliver, uh, you know, good information to, to kids or to my students uh, via internet technology. Yep. I'm or to parents, looking at the, or to parents, or to parents, right? I'm, assist, assist, assist the parents that are actually going to be doing and your job in a sense at home, and no one knows better than you. You've been doing it for possibly mm-hmm. years or decades, mm-hmm. and so you have a great perspective uh, to help evolve them instead of fighting it and resisting it and hoping it doesn't go that direction. You know, pivot and go. Okay, I'm going to try and help all those that go that direction and build yourself a potential business. Now, if it does go this way, um, what'll end up happening? Like anything else, it's going to get very competitive. Um, you're going to have a much smaller role in in government, obviously, because there's, you know public school either is going to have to drastically change or they're going to change the way they deliver education. So there may be a gap there. Um, be- between you know no public school and people going to the market for solutions, mm-hmm. um, it's going to get very competitive. Meaning, the good teachers are going to go are going to get very successful, and then the ones that aren't so good are probably going to find a, have a tough time, right? Uh, you know, making a living. It's a hard transition because it's going to be you know so damn competitive. Speaking of competitive, you guys all know that the 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 leisure athleisure wear market is. It's huge, right? It's a huge market. Oh, yeah. It's actually growing right now because people are home. Working from home. And they like to wear, you know, comfortable clothing that kind of looks good. It's not business attire anymore. Right. So, so Viore, for the audience doesn't know, Viore is a company we work with. They make athleisure wear really, really nice stuff. Some of the best stuff that we found anywhere. Anyway, their performance jogger, which is our one of our favorites. That's what I'm wearing. Yeah. Yeah. Performance jogger is amazing. It's got four thousand reviews on their on their site, and there are I, I, the last I checked, over a dozen blogs written specifically about no kidding their performance jogger. Wow. That, they're ranked as the best, the most comfortable, um, like leisure wear pants anywhere. And they compare them to like all the big brands and you know like, crazy. Uh, like Lulu and all that. Well, stuff. I think of them as the the originally the male version of Lulu, and j- just like the opposite, they like Lulu did. Like Lulu established himself in the yoga female community really well. They grew that brand. They've now branched into. They have been doing men's wear for a while and have made themselves an, a niche in that market. But then you had like Viore who saw that they catered first to the women. They kind of catered first to the men athleisure wear and then have branched in the women yeah. and have a line that's amazing for women and for men. Yeah. And they also did it the opposite way of, you know, instead of going brick and mortar first and then going digital, they were all direct to consumer first and scaled rapidly because they did not have a huge overhead. And now you see them popping up all over the place, which is well, really I'd, cool. I'd be interested to see how to it's been filtering in. Uh, you know, to these uh, like more like formal type settings too, because like I wear the meta pants, which the meta pants are more like slacks, but they're like super stretchy. It's almost something you'd wear probably on the golf course, mm. uh, but it, they're so comfortable and everything, but you could actually pass it off. Like I could go to a wedding and wear those. Like I feel. Oh, mm. that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see what I mean, I, with your, <laughs> with I'm your not joggers. the most uh, uh, classy guy in the world. No, that, but, I mean, yeah. that, uh, one, of the re- one of the reasons that, you know, Lulu blew up was because they that was what ended up happening. Yeah, I don't even you could wear workout clothes anywhere. Yeah, and that's what has happened. And uh-huh. that's where they, I mean, they created a space. Athleisure wear wasn't even a thing a decade ago. Yeah. It's now no, a thing. No, before that, sweats were like, you wore sweats at home and nobody, because you, nobody saw you. You'd be a tease. That's a, yeah. That'd be a joke right now. If you came, if you showed up to Old the, school sweats? Yeah. You know, showed yeah. up to work or you showed up to an airport. To, yeah, or at home places. or at the strip club. Right? Yeah. Wow. Somebody, somebody would- <laughs> 
<laughs> Whoa, dude. I'm just saying. Whoa, guy. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> Is that, I think that's that true, true, right? <laughs> All the dudes are in like sweat, like yeah, sweat joggers. Come on, you never heard that? It's, it's, oh, whatever, you guys. Now they can look somewhat dressed up a little bit. Wow, you found it. Maybe you I've found a, a market, dude. dude. I'm do telling you. you. I wonder if we should uh, call Viore and let them know if they're targeting that, right? Yeah, yeah. The guys who go <laughs> to sure. yeah, guys who go to strip clubs. Sad but guys who go to strip clubs. You see pop-up tents now at your local strip club? Hey, do you guys remember the old, when we were like, you know, kids, right, working out and the 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 workout clothes that you had back then were essentially like you know, they were sweats, like the ones you see like Sylvester Stallone wearing Rocky, the gray sweats yeah. and the gray hoodie or whatever. Do you remember how terrible those things were to work out in? Oh uh, yeah, you'd sweat in them, and that was it. They it's were like swamp thing. I heard <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude, they were disgusting, dude. <laughs> yeah. and you could you had to wash them immediately, or they would smell yeah, forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, like the worst uh, worst things in the and world. Most guys wouldn't because <laughs> yeah. they're disgusting, dude. So. Um, Time flies, man. I got. We are moving into the last trimester. Oh, I saw the uh, picture of Jessica. Wow. She looks great, dude. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. yeah. She's 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 re- she's really she's doing a really good job. How, how really have you, has she had an overall good experience? You know, it's, I feel right. like it's uh you know fifty fifty with with uh, pregnancy for women. Like some women just say it's the and most- some just aren't really honest about it either. They want to yeah. like per- portray this like oh it's so great and everything and then yeah I love it. Yeah. Meanwhile, the husband's being tortured at home. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You the real facts. I look it over and I'm like, what yeah. the fuck are you talking uh, about? Like I'm throwing <laughs> up and ripped oh, my face off so like two hours ago. <laughs> yeah. You know what though? You know, I'll, I'll say this. So um, she would tell you right now that she's loves it and, and uh, is sad that it's going to be ending soon. Um, that being said, the first trimester was challenging. The first trimester, she was super exhausted, n- nauseous all the time, all the time. And the poor girl was stuck on the couch half the time because she would move and get super exhausted or want to throw up. Her favorite foods all of a sudden became foods that were repulsive. Like Jessica loves meat. She could totally go on a carnivore diet and be happy. She loves steak. She loves ground beef. She likes it cooked rare. It's her favorite food ever. Just the smell or even just saying the word meat to her in the first trimester made her want to gag. So that was a bit of a challenge. But then she went into her second trimester Way more energy, uh, feeling good. She looks really, really healthy. Has she been able to reintroduce all those foods that she? Oh had? yeah, yeah, yeah. Even, oh wow. Even then, even then, she was she was like figuring out ways to eat those things because of the valuable nutrients you know that you want to get with them. And you know, evolutionarily, it makes sense, right? I think, you know, uh, you want your body probably is so hypersensitive to prevent foodborne illness, mm. and so you know, processed foods or white, you know, like bread and crackers. Your brain probably sees like, oh, this is very, very safe. Meat, you know, might have something in it. And so it's like yeah. better safe than sorry type of deal. It, but seem, in- it seems like their cravings too a lot of times are foods that like they haven't been introducing in their diet for a while. Like that's how it was with Courtney. Anyway. Yeah, Katrina was that. Katrina, I told you guys that she went bananas with oranges. Yeah. yeah. Orange slices. Like that was like her thing. I remember she you saying was that. Con- I mean, she, I ne- first of all, I never saw her eat orange slices when we were together the previous mm-hmm. nine years. And then all of a sudden, it became this thing where she was like crushing whole oranges, apples with with watermelons. Yeah. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, Je- yeah. Jessica's tomatoes. Here's a funny thing: she hated tomatoes before. Never mm. ate them on uh, by themselves. Mm. Now she's making, you know, two or three caprese salads every single day. Yeah. Uh-huh. With the, with the, yeah, and I pointed that out to her, and she's like, "That's not true." And I'm like, "When's the last time you ate a tomato?" She's like, "Oh yeah, this is kind of weird." <laughs> but yeah, now we're heading into the third trimester, which means I got three months, three more months, and then I have a little baby. Da, da, da. I'm going to be a dad again, which is, this is a, a, a different experience for me than the, than my other kids because my kids are older. Mm-hmm. You know, I've had enough time. Now they're, you know, my youngest is 10. And so I, I, I realized looking back how unpresent I was, how, how much I was, you know, moving and hustling, trying to, you know, make money and whatever. And I just wasn't as present as I could have been. So this time I'm really going to pay attention. So you think now, it's le- it's more excitement, less like fear of the unknown, obviously because you've been through it. Way, way, way more excitement and calm. Yeah. I'm very calm about you know the whole thing. So. Has this also given you more appreciation for your ex? Uh oh, you mean for the what like, she went it, through? Here's the thing: like you, you have two incredible kids. I mean, you're you guys are pretty close to Leave It to Beaver mm. family. Mm. Pretty close. I mean, aside from the obviously you guys are divorced. The children have turned out incredible, well mannered, very intelligent, great, great kids, healthy, all the above, right? Uh, and you, you admit that you feel like you were nowhere near as present in in their lives, and she really took over. And now, seeing how well they've been raised, and I mean, that's got to give you 
a, a different uh, outlook on on her and appreciation. Yeah, for so her. I was involved in the sense that you know I loved them, I hugged them, I kissed them. They knew their dad loved them. I would you know I was there for you know weekends we would spend together. I'd have dinner with them often. But what I mean by present is. It's more of a state of mind. Like you ever, you ever somewhere, and you're just kind of thinking off. Like when I would watch my kids, sometimes, sometimes they would be playing, and I would be reading or thinking or just not yeah. present, worried for, about getting clients or something, me, right? Yeah. You know, or or you know, I'm on you know social media trying to figure something out. Mm. You know, this time I'm going to be present, present because some of the stuff you think is like not that big of a deal. Like oh, my kid's playing with his toys. Like he does that every single day. Then when they grow up and you think about it, you're like, man, I wish I really watched and paid attention and cherished yeah, yeah. that moment. So I think a lot of that is, um, you know, less of probably that you've made any sort of a mistake because I don't think you've made any mistakes with them and more just being older and uh, wiser. Of course. Because I haven't had any kids and I'm very cognizant of that, like being around for moments. You and are. Then, and, and, and I make a point to be very, very present with him and- I don't ever do anything distracting when it's my time with him. I'm not my phone goes in yeah. a different room. I don't like watching TV. Like way more wise. No, that's 100, percent dude. Yeah. Think about when you were in your 20s if you had a kid. Nah, yeah, I, my mind would be. Yeah. You would have been good dad. You right. would have been a bad father. Yeah, I would have figured things out like yeah, you yeah. probably. Did. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying. Like I would have figured things out. I think I would have still raised a pretty good kid. But there's just there's just another level of of, of appreciate, appreciation that I have now for this phase that he's mm. going through and, and being a part of that. You know, I, I told you guys off air, he walked, right? So he took, oh, his, yeah, first, took, first his, took his first steps and it was such a crazy moment because the conversation that we had right before. So we this trip up here was unplanned on, on a whim. We all just said, let's go up to the Tahoe house. So let's just go record. And so we just, we all uprooted it and left this week. And so I like came home and told Katrina, I'm like, Hey, we're going to go up and work for a few days at the house. And, she goes, uh, oh, okay. You know, um, uh, do we have this covered? That yeah, everything's all fine. And uh, she made this like comment because he's been really, he's getting close to like walking. She's like, oh, what happens if you miss like his walking? I was like, my son would never do that to me. Uh, <laughs> I said, I said, my son, I've been so present and a part of everything and helped get him to crawl, and I'm going to help walk him. And you know, I I like to be that that person that is kind of constantly challenging. Uh, Katrina is the very loving, nurturing, supporting him all the time. I'm the one that's kind of manufacturing adversity already at a young age mm-hmm. and trying to challenge him to take another step or crawl a little bit further or do things on his own and let him struggle a little bit. And so I was like, I feel confident that I'm not going to miss that. And so I was spending time with him before we took off and, you know, practicing walking and trying to challenge him. And she was down in the, in the basement or the garage area and, uh, doing laundry. And so, you know, him and I came down, uh, stairs with her and I sat at the bottom of the stairs and we had these five gallon jugs and you know he's now he stands up sits down on his own and he's like right there right like he there's moments where he'll be get distracted with something in his hands and not realize he's not holding himself yeah, up he's not scared because he doesn't realize yeah exactly he's not scared he's like standing there doing stuff and then he'll squat down and then he'll pop right back up and I'm mm. like dude he can walk I yeah. know he can walk he's yeah. just got to get there and so he's doing this and uh, on the other side of the garage is his uh, his new you know Range Rover remote control car thing, right? And he looks he he sees it from the five gallon tank, and you know Katrina is doing laundry and she's watching him, and I'm sitting on the stairs and I'm just watching him. We're paying attention to him, and because he's so caught up in the moment, he just takes off and walks across the garage over, over the thing. And yeah. it was like, both of us are like staring at each other because we literally 15 minutes before that had this conversation. Now did you scream? I, sc- yeah. I screamed out of excitement and scared the shit out of him. <laughs> <laughs> he's not going to walk for another six yeah, months now. No, it's like, <laughs> oh, yeah, he's wrong. definitely not walking anymore while I'm gone for this week. <laughs> so, but I was, I was so, ex- I was so ecstatic that I, I, yeah. I did. I yelled at my poor dude. How many just, steps he get? He get oh, he got, yeah. oh, no, it was like a- He went all the way. Yeah, he walked across the garage. He took oh, wow. uh, eight to ten steps. Oh, it was awesome. not like the. He's already been doing these little. Um, like I was doing it the last night. I was with or the night before. I was uh, with him during bath time, and so part of our routine is, you know, Katrina will be kind of getting dinner ready for us uh, for uh, for uh, while I'm getting playing with him right before bath time, and I get his bath ready. And a lot of times I'll let him kind of you know play around in the in the bathroom and open drawers and do things. And he was he was just standing opening a drawer and he turns around and the bath is to his left and he just took like two steps to the bath and he grabs mm-hmm. it. So he's been doing that 
already for a little bit. Where but it's not like, like a walk. Not a walk. This was like a full on standing up, let go of the five gallon thing, saw his toy, realized it, and just made effort had, to go. And he had no idea why yeah. you guys screamed. Yeah. Probably like, huh? Yeah, it was yeah. exactly that. He That's looked so back cute. at me, started crying because I yelled. And, uh, but but oh, what man. a cool That's moment. A, and so random right after he so said cute. that. Yeah, you know, you, you, you're you speaking of cool moments, um, you know, through this process of, of, of Jessica being pregnant. This is something I realized too with my other kids, but I really, really am grasping it now. As a mother, you know, moms have this, unique thing that they get to experience, which is they they obviously have the baby inside of them and they bond with the baby way before mm-hmm. dads do or in a very different way. She's every day walking around carrying the baby and feeling the baby move all the time. If there's a loud noise, the baby jumps in her belly and she can feel it. And so she talks to the baby and whatever. To me, even though I have kids and I know what to expect, I mean, I have a bond but it's so much more abstract, you know? So I'm watching her develop this bond with the baby and I'm, there's a part of me that's envious. Like, oh man, I wish I could experience some of that. And I know what happened to me with my kids. As soon as they were born, it hit me like a truck. I remember it was like, they were born and then it just, everything hit me all at once. I'm like, holy shit, there's this kid, it's mine. Yeah. Wow, this right. is, but you know, to experience that, Process as, as difficult as it is, it's an amazing thing to watch, and it's something that we'll never. You bring experience. up uh, something too that I thought is in- interesting. Um, so I remember, I totally recall that, right? And that was just not that long ago for me. And I remember after he was born, something that I felt very appreciative of was Katrina really allowed me to take him a lot because sometimes moms can get really clingy right. right out the gates because they have built that bond. Also, a lot of times dads get scared. Yeah, so sometimes first, dads are scared. Right, right. dads are scared. They, as soon as they grab him, he they, he cries and they can't get him to calm down and sue them. And then as soon as mom gets a hold of him, he sues right away. So kind of dads a lot of times mm. will be like, okay, let her handle this. Uh, I'll figure this out later type of deal where I kind of just like asserted myself right away and, and took him a lot and was able to soothe him and and now make up for the nine months that she had uh, she had with him. I kind of got to do in the first, you know, three to four months a lot with him, and I really feel that I there's a uh, there's a difference with my relationship with him now that he's older because I did that. The, the bonding that happens with the skin on skin contact and then them regulating their breathing with your breathing mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in those initial weeks is actually extremely- It's like an imprint. Yeah. Very, very important. Um, you know, you talk to midwives and they take the baby out and they don't do anything. For, they put the baby right on you. Yeah. As long as everything's okay, right? Baby goes right on you, mm-hmm. skin to skin. And they say for the first week, they tell the mom- you're not going to do much but this. Baby's feeding and laying on you and skin to skin, which by the way, I just learned this the other day. Um, if the, They recommend that, and this comes from midwives, and midwives are experts at delivering babies. They're the, they're the, the people you want to talk to. They said that when a mom uh, first has a baby, to not get up and walk around much at all for the first week or two because if they do, the, the, they just obviously went through a very difficult, you know, labor is a, a difficult on the body. It's challenging on the body. The pelvic floor muscles, when you're standing and moving and walking or whatever, gravity can make them fall or collapse or weaken. So they recommend laying down a lot for the first week Mm -hmm. and allowing those, because otherwise you're you're vulnerable to things like prolapse and other interesting things that can happen with the pelvic floor muscles. And you hear this from a lot of, you know, when I would train clients later on, I learned some of these movements and exercises because, you know, these these are things that women sometimes are embarrassed to talk about, but... After having a baby, you know, they can't do jumping jacks because they, they, you know, they might, you know, pee a little pee, bit right. or lose some of that control. I did not know that. So for the for week or two afterwards, don't do anything at all and mm-hmm. lay down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, I want to thank you for bringing the uh, the meat sticks. Finally, <laughs> you weren't you, you weren't you weren't lying. You didn't eat them all. Not only did I thought I, you were. I thought they were. No. Go not on. only did I bring them, but I also reached out to Shauna and had them send another box. So like you guys, we should be fine for a, quite some time. For at least a day. You Dude. know, speaking of the bee sticks, <laughs> is that something that uh, that Jessica will eat right now or no? Yes, well, she, she will eat those yes, right now. Yes, yes. So she's, they're they're, they're it's a great source of protein. Well, you know, if you ever eat like uh, you know uh, jerky or meat sticks or things that you know can store for a while convenient um first off the quality is typically not good but they're always dry mm-hmm. you're you, they're always really dry well i mean these that are was, not that, that was the other that was our biggest okay we were hunting for i mean all of us are fans of beef jerky okay mm-hmm. there's, there's no, no uh 
there's no surprise in that. Uh, and we had gone through what I think three other companies mm-hmm. that we had send stuff. But over. they were all dry. Yeah. They didn't taste. Yeah, none good. of them I was excited about. No none, flavor. None of them tasted good. And here's what's hard: it's not only the points that you make, but then also grass fed too. Yeah. It's, uh, like we talk about with ButcherBox all the time. It, what was so rare about that company was, you know, for a grass fed beef for it to taste so good. The same thing goes for beef jerky. Finding a a healthier choice of beef jerky. That taste amazing. Mm-hmm. Also, yeah. is that's the best the best snack for kids. You want to give your kids a snack, you know? Oh, yeah. that they could. My kids love the jalapeno ones, which is surprised that's me. Oh, that's they, they like that's those. my favorite. Really, I like the summer sausage. There, oh, too. that's my least. Favorite. Oh, I love it. Yeah, oh, give yeah, them all to me. No yeah. original give teri- all the teriyaki or jalapeno yeah. are my go to, but I'm not a fan of the summer sausage. Mm, oh, okay. wow, good. You eat all those. Leave there the jalapeno ones. Justin loves that good old summer sausage. Bring it on, man. First question is from Mitch Pappas. In a full body routine, would you recommend sticking to the standard compound lifts on each day or would it be more beneficial to have variations each day? For example, barbell back squat day one, barbell front squat day two, goblet squat day three, and so on. I love that. Yeah. yeah. I love that. I mean, that's how we've built um, our, our most of our programs are, are built like that. And we've, we've talked about this recently, right? We've talked about... You know, the benefits of running a full body routine is that those exercises end up being the type of exercises that you choose for your full body routine versus if you did legs all in one workout, very few people are going to go back squat, front squat, goblet squat. Right. It yeah. would just tax the shit did, out of you. And if they did, it would be, they would lose their effectiveness because by the time you got to the second or third exercise, yes. you were totally gassed. That is one of the great benefits of, of programming full body is that you've got three you know, phenomenal yeah. exercise. Powerhouse for, exercises you right. sprinkle in there. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, there's one exception. I would say this. If you're somebody who's learning how to squat properly, um, then I think you should just do back squats each time you work out. Practice right. back squats each time you work out and get really, really good at them before you throw in a lot of these, uh, you know, different kinds of variations. So when I would train clients and, you know, once I got their mobility to the point where we could do a back squat – we would only do back squats at least two days a week. And if I trained them three days a week, sometimes all the days that I train them for maybe a few months until I saw their back squats look really, really good, solid and strong, then I would bring in a front squat or a goblet squat or a Bulgarian split stance. Well, that's a that's the beauty of back squats and the front squats, especially because they're so high skill based. You can still get a tremendous amount of value of consistently repeating those exercises mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for an extended period of time. Versus if we were, if that question was asked about leg pressing and you were leg pressing three days a week, I would see there's a lot less value mm-hmm. in that because it's not as high skill level. Yeah, yeah I totally agree. I mean, I think I think it all depends on what level you are in terms of your familiarity with those types of exercises. Like if 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 you do need like some time learning and developing the skill of front squatting, I would focus primarily on that for yeah, a few weeks, like if if not four to five weeks of just like trying to nail it down and then then, you know, start mixing it up and 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 putting them all like in succession. Yeah, that. my favorite combination for me, and it built a lot of muscle and a lot of strength. Not perfect, so I don't you don't do this forever, but it was a very effective combination. Was barbell squats on one workout, front squats on another workout, and then traditional deadlifts on the third workout. So every week I was doing those movements, and they're similar enough to where I'm hitting the body, most of those body parts with a little bit of frequency, but they're different enough. To where the scale is different, and I would get you know different results from them. Yeah, I like adding in some sort of a, a unilateral movement, like a Bulgarian split squat, or doing like a lunge yep. in there. I yep. think that there's a lot of value to that because that's really that's just a single leg squat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's definitely up there with you know top five leg exercises. Goblet squats uh, to me are a, a little similar to front squats. You can't load it as much. Those apply more to me for a client that I'm I'm using that for a particular reason, right? Mm, they have yeah. a hard time loading the bar. They in the can't front. put it on their shoulders. They, they either they have more of a forward lean when they squat. They don't break ninety. So I really enjoy using goblet squats for that. Uh, otherwise, that movement is so close to front squats that I would use something else instead of the mm. goblet squat yeah. in the place that he's recommending. Yeah, here. I probably wouldn't use goblet squats as much. Uh, Two is like. Uh, Zercher squats too as well. Oh, there you go. Yeah, which would be a good option. Second question is from Madison Fishy. You guys frequently mention consuming 0.8 to 1 gram of protein per pound of body weight and mostly from meat for its muscle building effects and satiating factors. 
However, we know from data from the Blue Zones, longevity comes from lower protein intake, and many of these people don't resistance train. What about higher meat-based protein diets for longevity and for individuals who don't train? I, you know, I love questions like this. All right, here's the problem with the observation that low protein uh, is best for longevity or any singular factor that you may see in some of these blue zones. These people live a long time because of the combination of all of the things that they do. Like they right. made the, the mention that they don't resistance train. Okay, follow them along throughout their day. And what you'll find is a lot of general activity, hiking, swimming, rowing. And they're usually along the equator where they get a lot of sun, vitamin D. And not to mention what we don't know is if they were to resistance train one to three times a week, how much better and healthier would they be? Right. That, that's the other thing. Like, would they benefit from doing a little bit of resistance training? Uh, would, it, would, they, would it be even better for them? I would say absolutely. Here's the other thing. They're not just low protein. They're low c calorie. All of these people uh, in these blue zones, one thing they all had in common is they just didn't eat a lot of food. They didn't consume. Now, it is true that eating a low-calorie diet in combination with a healthy lifestyle probably adds to longevity, and that's fine. Uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're somebody that also wants life quality, and quality of life means having a little bit more strength, uh, a little bit more muscle, um, then I see that as, you know, include that in the whole answer for yourself. What's, because it's not just about living longer, it's also about living better. What does that mean for you? Like, for example, mm -hmm. never eating birthday cake uh, ever, you'll probably live longer. But uh, are you going to live better if you avoid eating the cake at your kid's birthday or maybe something that you enjoy making with family members or whatever? Throwing those things in, thro th throwing all of those things in also adds, you know, quality. Well, also consider this. Or, you know, if you were somebody who lived in a blue zone or lived a lifestyle like that, and what, what comes to mind is like, you know, the the family that like literally lives on a farm and produces everything they eat. Mm. The amount of, you know, lifting hay and, yeah. and stacking boxes and, you know, pushing plows and like... You don't need to work out. Right, exactly. This person is getting a workout every single day. The food choices that they're making are whole foods. They're eating in a calorie deficit compared to how much they're burning with all their activity. Like, hell yes, if that if that's you, if you're asking this question, you live on the farm, you're growing all your food, you're doing all this stuff, skip working out and skip eating, you know, 0.8 to 1 gram per what you'll be fine and you'll live probably a very long life. But the reality is that's not 90% of the people listening to this podcast right now. In fact, 90% of you listening right now are probably fucking doing it sitting down, mm -hmm. sitting down in a car, sitting down in a computer, in your desk. Maybe a, the other 10% are rock, walking on a treadmill or exercising and listening to us. In your, but most of us live a very sedentary lifestyle. We live nothing like a blue zone. So to cherry pick some of the data to use that as an example of like maybe how we should live our lives. Yeah, you can't do that. It's tough. No, you know, you can't do that. And here's the other thing too. Um, now there are societies and cultures that we've that people have studied that eat a higher protein diet that do have uh, exceptional health, but they're also low calorie. Because here's the problem: all of the if you look at all the countries in the world that ate a lot of protein, you're also looking at generally speaking, all the countries in the world that eat a lot of calories. So Americans eat a lot of protein in comparison to blue zone con uh, countries, but they also just eat a lot of everything. Yeah. We eat more fat, we eat more carbs. Throw everything in there. We eat way more just calories in general. So that's one of the big things. Now, I do have a hack for this. Let's say you are somebody that's, you know, you want to build muscle, you like eating a high-protein diet, like the way it makes you feel, the, the way it makes you look, but you do identify that there may be some longevity benefits to eating a low calorie diet, you can actually get some of those benefits by fasting occasionally. Yes. Mm -hmm. So maybe you normally do eat a high protein diet. You're trying to build muscle, build strength, but maybe once every other month you do a 48 or 72 hour fast. Um, you're going to reap a lot of the benefits just from doing that. I, th the, I think there's, sorry to interrupt you, no but problem. I mean, to, I, uh, to this point you're saying right now, uh, and I believe our good friend, uh, Ben Pukolsky uh, recommends this. You could protein fast. Yeah. 
You, if, if you, you want, can go low protein for a week. Yeah, Absolutely. or even a day. Well, I think he recommends it once once a week for a day. Mm. Once a week for a day, go protein fast. There is nothing wrong with that. And the, the same benefits that we're seeing that these that the people in the blue zones are getting from this, you'll reap those similar benefits by just either doing what Sal is saying, which is you know every other month doing a, a, a massive you know two day or forty eight hour type of forty eight hour seventy two hour fast from all foods or simply choosing every other week or once mm. a week doing a protein fast and you are doing like and you used to do this a lot and you introduced me to it i did it is uh you know occasional all vegan day day where you eat that way so there's lots of values and ways for you to get these similar benefits of a lot of the research that we see between these people that are on low calorie diets low protein low everything oh, that's what that's what fasting is all mm -hmm. about Next question is from Mason Hartsock. For trainers who have no interest in online training, what are the best next steps to survive and thrive as we progress away from lockdown and gyms begin opening again? Oh boy. I, can we address the question first? Like, I find it really interesting that um, that somebody would ask a question and um, and be like, you know, for someone who does not want to do that, like, I, I'm going to take a hard stand. Listen, I didn't want to do that. I loved personal training in person. I like the real interaction with real people. It doesn't get much better than that. It doesn't. It's uh, it's more enjoyable. It, you, there's, I think there's other, there's lots of benefits to it, but because you don't like it, uh, to ignore the evolution of of what's happening right in front of your eyes, I think is is a is a bad idea, uh, and it doesn't necessarily mean. That I think you have to go from being an online trainer because of COVID. Now, all of a sudden, you decide you're going to be a virtual trainer completely. That's not what I mean by that. But there are some simple things that, if I were to advise you to become a virtual trainer, that I would also tell you some steps to take, and that would be to build a virtual presence. Mm -hmm. Right? There's a tremendous amount of value for you, even if you continue to build an a, a, an in-person business, to creating content that lives in the virtual world. Mm -hmm. So building a, a YouTube channel, building a Facebook page, building an Instagram page, writing blogs, writing free white papers and guides, uh, you know, creating things like that is only going to support your in-person business. Meanwhile, it also protects you in case that completely disappears or gets reduced from, you know, X amount percentage of population down to, you know, 50% less than that. So I I think instead of resisting ever becoming a, a virtual trainer or thinking like that, you should build your current model as if you were going to, to protect yourself and also support your in-person business. That yeah. would be my advice. I remember even, and this is way before all this stuff went down where, you know, virtual training was a lot more prevalent and like it's really necessary right now. I, I was looking at it as a way of systematizing my business and figuring out the way that I do everything and being able to duplicate that uh, and be able to hand that off and and look at it more of like I'm I'm running this business to then you know have the availability to step away from my business and pass on my business to somebody else. That's just a smart way to look at any business. Well, yeah. one of the one of the most beautiful things that has has happened from this, and I get this sometimes. Like I have I have some friends that still don't understand Mind Pump. They don't listen, they don't do whatever, but they're like, you know, they're starting to hear the success. They know somebody else who listens and that's like, oh my God, like so-and-so knows your podcast and this and that. And, you know, and now they're asking like, well, what if like, what happens when you reach all the fitness people and they've either bought your program or not? And like, you guys aren't making any money. Like, what would you do? Or how are you going to handle that? And it's like, what's beautiful is we all could always fall back on training people in, in person. Mm -hmm. And it would be easier now than it's ever been in our entire life. Oh, because we have a huge online presence. Yes, because yeah. we've built a, a network of, of people that we've provided a ton of free, valuable, virtual information to that if one day we all said, okay, Mind Pump, Insta or Mind Pump uh, podcast is shutting down, but Sal, Justin, Adam are opening uh, their availability to train clients in person who would like to sign up. I don't think that would, any of us would have a problem actually making that pivot at all. And it, it protects us if we were ever to do that. Here's something to also consider for the current market. So I could see this being an opportunity um, for people who, for trainers who like to train people in person. You, you heard us earlier talking about schools and how there's micro schooling and homeschooling is going on uh, like crazy. And people and yeah, in California, they're shutting gyms down. There's still a demand for fitness, but I think that there may be an opportunity to deliver it 
uh, to people's homes. Um, I believe mm-hmm. when people are doing this micro schooling thing, they're going to still want an activity or exercise, you know, portion. And these people may also hire tutors to help with their kids. Why not hire a trainer to show up once right. or twice a week? Do to their physical education. Do the physical training for the kids, or and who to, better to do it than some PE than a personal teacher. trainer? Right, right. Or to to take the whole family what through a, a workout. Point. What a great point. Or to advertise that you'll go to people's homes and you take all the safety precautions. You wear a mask. Uh, you stay, you know, uh, at a distance from your client. You bring your own equipment. It's, it's all sanitized. sanitized. Exactly. And and they work out, and you do it outdoors, and you go from home to home. That's a market that was difficult to penetrate before for trainers. Yeah. I feel like that's an that would be a, a much more open market now. Yeah, and you factor in your travel, you know, and all that kind of stuff in terms of like, I mean, I actually ran a business very similar to that towards the end of my career, just because my whole goal was to be able to provide, uh, you, you know, I could I could basically fit any sort of schedule. Like I'm going to find my way in there. And so a lot of times that meant me having to actually physically be at their work or at their home. And you really don't need a whole lot of equipment, a lot, not, a, not a big investment for you to have uh, within your vehicle. And then bringing that in, you can provide them real, like great workouts. So oh it's, 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 it's ripe for that, for sure. Next question is from Netflix and Rachel. How can I fix my anterior tilt? Okay, so sh- she is referring to an anterior pelvic tilt. Now, for those of you who don't know what that means, imagine looking at someone from a side view. This is where the lower back arches and the butt kind of sticks out and the, bu- the belly kind of comes forward, okay? This is a common posture issue that you see in people mm. in, in modern societies, mainly because we do a lot of sitting uh, and we don't have good uh, core strength. So this mm-hmm. posture starts to appear because your hip flexors start to tighten up to try to support your core. Start worrying about back pain specifically. Yeah, back pain, hip pain, uh, wearing high heels encourages this type of posture. So if you wear a lot of heels, you'll start to get this posture. And so it just it doesn't feel good. And then if you go to exercise and barbell squat or deadlift or anything else that involves low back stability, you know, it, it can cause uh, a lot of problems. So in order to fix it, you want to strengthen the opposing, you know, movement pattern, if you will. One great exercise, uh, first off, you got to strengthen your core. Everybody who understands anterior pelvic tilt will tell you to strengthen your core. But the problem with just saying that is people who have tight hip flexors and weak cores can go do sit-ups and leg raises and all these ab exercises, and Mm. they can perform them and not get good core strength because they don't realize that their hip flexors are doing all or of the work. Or they're reinforcing the problem because they keep using that same muscle. Group. And that's right. In yeah. fact, they make things worse. So strengthen your core, but learn how to strengthen your core. On our YouTube channel, there's a movement called hip flexor deactivators. Check that out. I teach you how to deactivate the hip flexors and then activate the core muscles so that you can start to separate the two and strengthen the core to kind of help offset that uh, posture. Well, this is another example of the, this answer lies for sure in the Mind Pump TV channel on YouTube. Uh, uh, in fact, Serene just did a video. The latest video that has gone up on that channel is uh, you know pelvic clockwise. I forget the title of it, uh, but it, it will definitely help with this issue. Uh, the number one downloaded video or viewed video on there is the three best secrets to build a better butt. I actually address this in that mm-hmm. and with floor bridges, and mm-hmm. I talk about this. So even though yeah, it doesn't, floor bridges are great. The, even though anterior pelvic tilt is not in the title, uh, the movements and the priming that I talk about to build a butt, because a lot of times this is what happens when somebody has uh, an anterior pelvic tilt, it, it shifts the weight over uh, into their quads and like their hip flexors, like Sal's alluding to, why you want to do hip flexor deactivators. And then when you go into like a squat, a lunge, or any leg or butt type of exercise, they end up developing or feeling most of it in the quads and not the butt where they want. So they, the video that I did on the the butt is really addressing why it's so valuable is it's addressing anterior pelvic tilt, which many, many people suffer from and why that's so important. If you then want to develop a butt, because you first have to address the anterior pelvic tilt, get the glutes firing properly. And then what types of exercises to support that. And then in conjunction with that, what Sal is talking about, about building the core and supporting that, all of that together is what's going to fix the anterior pelvic tilt and then, pelvic tilt and then also 
help build your it's, glutes or posterior Yeah, another chain. great one is our, our wall test. Uh, and oh, and yeah. really just to gain access to the TVA again. And so it, it really, like, a lot of times, like, with the anterior pelvic tilt, you, you lose that access to, to core muscles that are vital in stabilizing your spine. And so that's why a lot of these pains uh, persist because, you, you, I mean, you have to be able to distribute that force somewhere. And so a lot of times it stops in uh, inconvenient places where your body, like, takes on a lot of that stress and creates this pain. And isn't that, Doug, we can, they can still access that webinar that Justin did for Prime, right? That's in that webinar. Yeah, yeah. mapsprimewebinar.com. Maps Prime okay, excellent. Yeah, it's by far the most, if I did an assessment on a new client, um, I could pretty much guarantee that I would see uh, anterior pelvic tilt and forward shoulders. Like, oh, so common. I would say eight or nine out of 10 people sure. yep. have that issue. And here's the thing with these posture deviations your body moves uh, in the direction that your muscles dictate. So if there's muscles that are weak or tight or constantly in a mild state of tonus or slightly tensed all the time or lax and not connecting very well, your posture would just follow that. And then what happens over time if you don't fix it is it gets worse and worse and worse. And the way you fix it is by strengthening the muscles that need to be strengthened. You cannot fix this problem with you know, belts and, you know, braces and things that will hold you in position, that's only going to cause the issue to get worse. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio. Uh, what's up, everybody at YouTube? Come check us out, Mind Pump Podcast. You can also find us all on Instagram. Justin's at Mind Pump Justin. You know this. I'm at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam's at Mind Pump Adam increasing frequency, I walk into them and you could tell they were switching browser yeah. windows really fast <laughs> yeah. to, to like Nothing show that they were, they were on task. <laughs> and where, where my mind goes is I can tell them, hey, you're, you're hiding something from dad and taking your computer away from a week, you're grounded. Right? But what I said to both of them in two separate conversations, because sometimes you want to be